Hello and good evening to everybody on the call and um, welcome to the global network live in another episode of a series bringing you inspired people and guests all around the world. I'm really, really delighted um, to welcome a really good friend of mine, Matt Sutton, all the way from Singapore. Uh, I first met Matt in 2004 uh, when we were both starting out of our, our careers in different fields, so to speak. Um, but I've always been impressed by Matt. His outlook on life is amazing. His outlook on business is amazing. And to see the transition that he's had um, from where he started to where he is now is just absolutely phenomenal. So uh, yeah, really pleased to have you this evening, buddy. Hello, Greg. How are you doing? Really well, thank you. How's, uh, how's Singapore? You're in, uh, you're in lockdown right now, right? Well, you're looking very handsome, so that's a good start. <laughs> <laughs> I am, yeah. So actually, I was in Bangkok for four weeks. Um, I have an apartment there with my girlfriend. So I was with my girlfriend in Bangkok for four weeks. Woke up on Sunday morning and they just changed. I'm a permanent resident in Singapore. And they just changed the rules so that from midnight that night, permanent residents had to go into a, a government uh, quarantine, a government facility quarantine. So I scrambled the flight back and got in at half past 10 like an hour and a half before they changed the quarantine rules. So I'm now on the official stay at home notice, which means I have to stay at home for 14 days. I get three text messages a day where I have to submit my location. And then I get a phone call a day and I have to put a video on to show that I'm here looking like shit and in my house. And, uh, and then they knock on the door. So just randomly they knock on the door and I have to sort of sign that I'm still at home. So I'm day 12 on a 14 day stay at home. So, you know, I haven't really spoke to that many people. So just, you know, to have 15 people to talk to all at once is quite exciting for me. So, yeah, I might just curl up in a corner and keep the video on and then we can hang out. <laughs> if anybody wants to speak to you after, you'll be on yeah. all night. <laughs> just, just don't leave me, please. Don't leave me. <laughs> well, look, the, the format for tonight, for anybody that uh, is on the, uh, the Zoom that hasn't been on before, um, we're going to probably spend about half an hour uh, just talking to Matt about his story, we're going to be sharing a few business tips and ideas. And then what I'd like to do in the whole purpose of, of, of this kind of uh, show, so to speak, is to invite people on. So if you're on the call right now and you want to ask any question during uh, the conversation, just send me a private message on the chat box, which should be down the bottom of your Zoom account. Um, send me through the question that you've got for Matt. And then what I'll do when we finish um, chatting, I'll invite you on. Um, hopefully you're not uh, naked behind the video screen. We can open up your video and you can ask Matt any question that you want. And uh, yeah, we'll try and keep it to sort of 45 minutes to an hour if that's okay, mate. Sounds great. Okay, so look, I, I know quite a lot of your history and I know quite a lot of your background anyway, but I'll probably not do it as much justice as if you actually open up and just tell your, your story if you can. Yeah, I mean, you've heard my story a hundred times, right? So, uh, yeah, and uh, obviously I'm from, you know, I'm from Lancashire, England, uh, Lancashire. Uh, I uh, went from Lancashire to London, so I'm a London School of Economics graduate. Um, did my three years there, and kind of when I finished, you know, the classic thing, didn't really feel like, you know, living in Zone 5 and getting the train into London every day and earning 20 grand a year, but also had no idea what I wanted to do. Uh, I wanted to travel, but I had no money. And uh, it was actually my girlfriend at the time that came up with the idea of, hey, you know, maybe we can travel and work. Um, and so we looked around and we found that there was a lot of opportunities to, to go to China. So this is 2001. There's a lot of opportunities to go to China. So we went for an interview uh, and it's quite cute when I look back, you know, we were in that, in, in, in that interview, like desperate to get this opportunity. Uh, but of course, you know, like we were two London School of Economics graduates, they couldn't believe their luck, you know. So we did the interview. And like the next day they were like, Hey, you know, can you, can you go to Shanghai like next week? So I was like, boom, this is awesome. Let's go. Uh, and then my mum reminded me that I didn't actually have a passport. Uh, because even though these days I travel 250 days out of every year at that time, I'd never actually been abroad. Uh, so we scrambled an emergency passport. Uh, I flew to China. So we crash landed in Shanghai in 2002. Um, and then spent a year, you know, teaching English, uh, playing guitar in bars, modeling underpants, you know, all the kind of things you do uh, yeah. when you try to make a book. Uh, and then when the year was up, I met so many great people in that year and met so many entrepreneurs. Foreign direct investment into China at that time was double digit. Uh, playing for a football team and everybody just seemed to be doing cool stuff. Um, and I was like, you know what, I think I'm going to stay out here. So, you know, I made a 
kind of a, a decision that my parents weren't that happy with, you know, like three years to get a you know, joint honours degree from London School of Economics. And then I decided to stay on in China teaching English. Uh, obviously, what I realized was if I'm going to stay out here, uh, you know, I need to try to figure out what I'm going to do. Not that there's anything wrong with teaching English, but, you know, it wasn't my, it wasn't my vocation. It wasn't what I wanted to do. Uh, and so uh, a guy who I think is actually on the call who I played football with, I got involved with a guy who was the China correspondent for Reuters. And he was setting up a B2B publishing company. And so we came in as like the original guys to set up the commercial team. Uh, 22 years old, never worked, never sold anything ever. Um, and then just started going out with all these prototype products, uh, business guides, websites, foreign, direct, foreign enterprise directories, investment reports, uh, magazines, and selling advertising space across them. And it's incredible three years, you know, 100 phone calls a day, uh, basically hustling to me now, right? Like selling to 40 year old decision makers with you know, a really cheap suit on uh, and no, no real idea what we were doing, uh, but we just got better and better. Uh, and it went really well. Uh, that business is still there today. You know, it became a really high profile English language uh, business information company. Uh, we made a lot of money. Uh, I decided that I didn't want to stay in China. And so I moved on. Um, and again, and a lot of this story, and I'll try and keep it reasonably short so that we can dig into it after this, uh, after this relay of it. Uh, but a lot of this story is about being in the right place at the right time. Uh, and I met a guy who was uh, spearheading CBS, Viacom's entrance into China, and they were buying up Chinese outdoor advertising companies. Uh, by that point, I'd learned Chinese. Uh, and so I came in as kind of like the, the conduit between the, these, these like what, what were basically like arms of the government who owned advertising space and a super into like US hardcore sales organization. And I came in as the commercial director to run the sales teams and, and, and be the link. Did that for a year and a half. The guy that I reported into, who I'm still very good friends with, he was living here, actually hiding out from Chinese uh, corona issues for the last two months. Uh, he was the ex-commercial director for Yahoo. He contacted me and said, hey, we're thinking about setting up an ad network in Singapore. You know, do you want to come in at the ground up? Um, and again, running theme on this story, right people, having great people around you at the right time. I said, yeah. So I packed up my suitcase, flew to Singapore, never been there before. Uh, you were there. And so we, we, we moved in together. Uh, they were great times. Um, and then really what started was that it was a decade. So I arrived in, I did five years in China. I arrived in Singapore in 2008. And from 2008 to 2018, went on this just incredible journey. So uh, I became managing director of Active Digital. Uh, it had some, uh, the group that owned it were a public company, a PLC. Uh, they had some financial problems and they actually wanted me to shut the business down and, and relocate back to China and start all over again in China. But I had a great team and we had a profitable business. So I did what's called a management buyout and I set up another company and then through the company I set up, I bought Active Digital, the ad network from the PLC, and then I sold it to an India-based ad tech company. So then I was CEO of a, of, a, of a company which was owned by a holding group company. They've raised like $100 million from US investors. Um, and then within Conley, um, we then bought another company and we stuck those two businesses together. So we then became about 150 people. Um, and then inside Conley, I built... Uh, what at the time was Asia's largest social media agency. Uh, I flew to San Fran, sat down with Twitter, uh, signed a two year agreement to launch Twitter's business in Asia uh, through a full service business partnership. We hired their teams, we set up their billing. Uh, Miguel, who's on the phone call here, was the, the marketing director of Singtel, which is Singapore's largest telco at the time. They were actually the, the launch advertiser. Um, sat down with Facebook, signed a strategic relationship with Facebook, so we were de facto their exclusive sales house. Uh, I flew to Israel. Uh, which was amazing and met a load of ad tech companies uh, and found a social ad tech company and brought that to Asia through a five-year partnership. So that was a five-year journey. By the end of that five years, we were a $70 million social media business. Um, and then we sold that business to what is Asia's largest telco holding group, Axiata. Um, and I became CEO of uh, Axiata's digital business um, and then brought together the social media assets, the telco assets, the digital people in, in the telco, the digital people we had to build a data-driven digital marketing agency. Um, so that was from 2015 to 18. So that was like a 10 year journey. And at that point I took a year out. Um, and I think we're gonna talk a little bit about that later. 
Um, and I set my own consultancy up. And through my consultancy, I've been meeting other companies and bringing them to Asia. So what started off as a year out in, in China in 2001 uh, just turned into this sort of 10-year journey. Yeah, not, not bad from starting as a teacher, eh? Yeah, I mean, not as only wrong with being a teacher. And, and actually, I miss it, you know. And, and one of the things that I've been doing recently is, is figuring out when I can go and do some coaching in Thailand and sort of uh, teach kids in, in Thailand because it's incredible. What do you miss about it? Do you miss the simplicity of it or do you just miss that being able to instantly add impact onto people? Uh, I mean, both of those things, right? I mean, we're going to talk a little bit later about, you know, what your motivations are in life and, and yeah. um, what is your postcard and, and what do you want to do? Uh, so it's both of those things. One is absolutely the simplicity, right? When you look back, you know, life was great. It was so easy. You know, hanging around with kids and, and teaching them English. It's so rewarding and fun and simple. Uh, the other part of it is, yeah, just doing something that rewarding where you feel like you're really giving something rather than you are giving stuff when you build businesses, but a lot of it is just about trying to get bigger and better, right? Yeah, absolutely. So look, mate, that, I mean, that story from, uh, you know, start to finish is super impressive, but I also know it was a lot more difficult than you made it sound. So let's, let's start with China, because obviously having lived in China myself, that's not easy just to turn up, because you were how old? I was 21. 21, turning up to China, don't speak the language, no one speaks a word of English. Like for anyone that hasn't actually been to China, it is, it is crazy how little English is actually spoken. Like it's zero, right? It's, it's just, it's another planet, basically. Um, yeah, yeah it's so, an amazing time, and I haven't really traveled either. So, I mean, I remember really well the first day that we arrived uh, with my girlfriend at the time, and I had like a bag and a, and a guitar, and, and we got off, we got off, <laughs> we got off, yeah. Very, very rock and, and roll. <laughs> in 2001, uh, and they put us on a bus, uh, and then they started taking us into Shanghai. And Shanghai, I mean, we're talking 17 years ago, right? So China has changed a lot in that time. But we were going around, and there's some people from China on the call, but we were going around the ring roads that take you into Shanghai. And there's a lot of really derelict kind of old apartment buildings. And I remember my girlfriend sort of pointing at one saying, oh, imagine if we're staying in one like that. And the one that she pointed at was 10 times better than the one that we actually ended up in. Uh, and the very first night, we were just, you know, couldn't speak a word of Chinese, dumped in this apartment. Uh, it was a real culture shock, but I had an amazing time in China. You know, I was there at a great time, um, and it really helped me grow up as well. Yeah. So, what was your, what was the first biggest challenge you faced then in China, uh, when it comes to when it comes to business or life? What was the, What was the biggest challenge you faced initially? I mean, I think I think the first thing is just being you know being in a completely alien culture and being in a different culture than the one that you're used to uh, presents its own challenges. I think in some ways you know, because of globalization, there's a lot more similarity between countries these days than there was back then. And it's easier to integrate yourself. And obviously as you get older, you also learn those skills. Uh, but you know, being a 21 year old landing in China, having never traveled before or speak a word of Chinese uh, was an incredible experience. And in some ways, you know, I always say this, you kind of, it's a shame that you'll never have that experience again. You know, like if you think now, you could travel, you could go anywhere, you've got your phone with you, we're, the internet, we're so globally connected. And, you, and also you get better at traveling. I travel 250 days a year now. But that experience of like no internet, no phone, landing in somewhere completely alien like China, where you would not see any other foreign people for, you know, for days on end. What an amazing experience and you'll never have that again. Uh, but I think maybe the thing that you're alluding to is, is kind of what we were chatting about the other day, which is when... Uh, you know, I've been teaching English for a year and a half and kind of decided if I'm going to stay in China, I need to you know, not do this anymore. Uh, and I'm going to have to figure out a career of some sort. Uh, and I got this opportunity to, to join Sino Media uh, and start doing sales. Uh, but it was, at a, it was no basic commission only. Uh, and I never sold anything before ever. And at the time I was getting paid about 600 pounds a month and about 400 pounds of that was rent. And so I literally had no money. Uh, and so I, you know, obviously a lot of people at the time were telling me, you know, don't do it You're crazy. You know, what if it goes wrong? What are you going to do? And I couldn't afford the rent, right? Because like literally the next month I had no more money because all my money was just like pants them out. So I moved into a fellow teacher's house, which was a what, two guys in a one bedroom apartment. So one of the teachers was in the other bedroom. One of the teachers was in the living room and I moved into the balcony. And so I put my, I put my sleeping bag uh, down in, in, in the balcony, which is like this glass balcony. 
And it was either really hot or freezing cold. And I lived on that balcony for about four to five months on a balcony in a one bedroom apartment. And it got to the point where I couldn't afford to actually, it was, it was commission only. And three months in, I hadn't sold anything. Like I'd not sold shit. And I pride myself now on like, you know, being the world's best sales guy. And, uh, and I hadn't sold anything, you know, and, uh, and I had no more money. So I couldn't even afford to get to work. And I was literally, uh, and you know, I've got friends that I'm still very good friends with today who love bringing this up, but I was stealing sandwiches from the supermarket across the office to feed myself. Like I had nothing. And obviously everybody was saying, no, you need to give this up. You haven't sold anything in three months. Um, but my attitude to it was, I was looking around me and other people were selling things. And I was like, well, it's just about getting the words in the right order at the right time. Like if they can do it, I just need to stay here long enough and I'll get the words in the right order at the right time to start selling things. And of course, bit by bit, you get a little bit of success. Um, and then, you know, it went nuts and it went crazy. Uh, but, it, but, you know, it was an amazing way to sort of get your spurs as it was and put yourself under that pressure and do that. Um, and one of the things that, you know, I talk about a lot with people, uh, you know, in organizations I'm working with or, you know, in those environments where people ask me questions about your journey or whatever is people say a lot like, oh, you're so lucky and you're so blessed and you're so fortunate. And I definitely am. I feel very lucky and very fortunate and very blessed and a lot of amazing things have happened to me. But that look and that fortune, it didn't just land itself. You know, it's like you put yourself out there, you back yourself and you make your own luck. And of course you're fortunate when it works out, but you have to back yourself and, and take that chance. And sometimes people look at other people and go, oh, well, you've got something that I haven't, you know, but, but most of the time they haven't. They just put the work in and put themselves out there and, uh, and we're willing to take that chance on themselves. Yeah, I mean, obviously being from the, the financial services sector for the last 17 years and seeing, you know, you know that drill. myself yeah. included, right? You know, I had yeah. a commission only job when I was based in the UK to fly out to Hong Kong to an industry that I've never been involved in before on a whim. Yeah. Uh, and there's lots of people that do move out to the likes of Dubai and Singapore with a, with a very similar opportunity. It, it's that opportunity that is, you know, miles down the road okay, where they've got to go through the, the hardships to get there. Was, it, was there a point where you actually thought, I actually can't do this, that you nearly did give up? And you did think, okay, I'm, I'm beating you, I need to give up. Or what was the driving factor that actually kept you going? Like, what were you trying to prove? Yeah, I mean, that is a great question. So the first thing is actually no, like maybe I'm an idiot, but, uh, but no, you know, I always thought, you know, there's some things that obviously, you know, some, someone might put gold in front of you, which is impossible. And you can look at it and go, there's just no way that that can be done. But when you're in a situation where it's just a case of learning something and it's, and it's a learnable skill, and if you work hard enough at it and you do it enough times and you put yourself out there enough, you have enough conversations, you get better at those conversations and you just keep going. Like anything like that, where it's like, well, if you can do it, I can do it. I've always had that attitude where it's like, well, if you can do it, I can do it. You know, anybody can learn a language. Anybody can learn how to play the guitar. Anybody can learn, you know, all these things are just learnable skills. Yeah. So, you know, I think a really good attitude to have in general in life is, well, if you can do it, I can do it. Now there's, a, there's other things that, um, you know, there's, there's a couple of, I guess, disclaimers or caveats to that, which is, you know, uh, there are certain things that someone's going to have ad unfair advantages on you at, you know, whether they're physical or genetic or certain elements. And you need to, as you, you know, accept those and then figure out what your swim lanes are and how much you can achieve. Um, and then I also think, and I've personally only learned this as I get older, uh, that you can't do everything on your own. You know, I always used to have the attitude that, you know, I'll go in there. And, and I will just, it's impossible for me to fail because I'm me, you know, whatever needs to be done, I'll just fix it and sort it out. And, and, I, and I take that responsibility and that pressure on board. As long as I get a little bit older, I realize sometimes you can just be, you can be doing everything perfectly. And you can be bringing your awesome, you can be working super hard, but you can't win everything on your own. Sometimes circumstances are, are not working in your favor. And sometimes also it's, it's a good idea to not keep running at that. And there's an opportunity cost to trying to win something which is unwinnable maybe you should go and focus on something else. So, you know, the summary and the short answer to it is like, no, like, you know, if, it, if it's a doable thing, back yourself to do it, put the work in, make it happen. Uh, but, but then one of the things that, I, that I've like, never be beaten is one of my, uh, it's on my mission statement. It's one of my philosophies, just don't be beaten. Well, I, I, I always remember you running around a football pitch going, you can't beat me. <laughs> you can't beat me. You can't beat me. I'll just keep going. You can't beat me. Uh, so I've always had that attitude. 
Uh, but as I've got a bit older, I've kind of added on, but know when you're beaten. You know, and so when I, you know, when I'm coaching people or, you know, whatever that is or in these conversations, I always say, you know, have that attitude that you can't be beaten, but know when you're beaten, you know, and, and it might seem a little bit weird at first, but if you have that lens, like I cannot be beaten, but sometimes I'll just, it's not taking the defeat. It's accepting that this is not a win for me anymore. You know, it's like, it's not worth me keep running at this. You can't, I can never be beaten, but I know when I'm beaten and I know when this is just an unwinnable thing, I'm going to back out of that and go and focus on something else. And if you have that lens, um, I think that's a good lens to have. And it'll also stop you from going crazy. Yeah, it's a really good point. I mean, I, 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 I fell into the trap myself of like, I'm not going to give up on this. I'm not, and I just end up wasting so much time and energy on something that ultimately you kind of know in the back of your mind, it is yeah. unwinnable, but you, you just, won't. You just yeah. will not drop it. Yeah, absolutely. Have you got any examples of that? No, any, yeah, I've got a few. So I think one of them is, uh, I told that story before about being in uh, at CBS um, in Beijing. And so um, Nick Forber, who was supposed to join today, but he's got another meeting, um, who's a mentor of mine and gave me that opportunity. Uh, he kind of hired me, but his KPI was to hire me and then leave. So he kind of like, you know, off he went to England. And I was then left with in this hundreds and hundreds of, of Chinese people. And then just little old me, you know, I was like 27 years old, commercial director of CBS. Uh, and it was an unwinnable situation. You know, like I was doing my best and, uh, you know, and I was as good as I could be at that age. And I was good for my age, you know, and I was very ambitious. And I was smart and I was hungry and I was nice and I was, you know, consensual and all of those things. But it was just that, that environment was not an environment that I could win in. Um, but at the time I just kept going at it, you know, um, and then an opportunity came up to go to Singapore and part of me was like, but I haven't won this yet. You know, like I'm not the boss here and you know, not everybody thinks that I'm awesome and we've grown revenue a bit, but not as much as I want to do. And so part of me was like, maybe I'll just not take this amazing opportunity with this guy that loves me to go and move into digital and move to Singapore, which is everything that I want. And I'll stay here in this environment, which I'm really hating, but just to like, and I'm not leaving until I win. Uh, but luckily, the never be beaten part of, of that equation uh, kind of won through and I decided to go to Singapore and set that up. Um, and it was the best thing that I ever did because I went on this 10 year journey, which was really, you know, you're sort of talking about starting here and then ending here. It was really my move to Singapore and then doing the MBO at Active and, and then Twitter and then Facebook and all these things kind of came from that. And so if I hadn't have kind of let that little, you know, if I'd have let that little, you know, Mickey in my ear, who was like, you know, you, you're Rocky, just don't give up. Like it's not over until you've won. If, I, if yeah. I'd have let that voice win, I, you know, I might still be in China and I, I might have really failed there. Yeah, it's like, it's the arrogant voice on your shoulder. It's the arrogant voice, exactly, yeah. Yeah, sometimes you just got to lose the ego, right? I say that a lot. Oh, yeah, you just got to lose the ego. So I actually thought you moved to Singapore to follow me, but clearly that's not the case. So you went to follow Nick and the opportunity. I just told you that at the time. Yeah. I needed a room. <laughs> well, I, I think it probably brings us on to the topic I want to get onto, which is um, like the importance of people that you surround yourself with and the importance of people, whether that be in personal or business. Um, obviously, you've been fortunate like myself to work with some awesome people around the world and especially in Singapore doing what you've been doing. Um, how much of your own like success right now do you put down to like individuals or teams or groups of people? Yeah, it's a great question. So uh, I haven't really thought about a number, but it's definitely more than half. Uh, and the older that you get, the more you realize that it's really the people around you, the people you have in your like for want of a better word, ecosystem, right? The friends that you have, the family that you have, the business contacts that you have, the teams that you have, uh, you're nothing without them. Uh, and the older, and it's not just about, you know, everybody knows, oh, to be successful, you need to build a great team, right? So that's a corporate thing. Uh, but I'm talking bigger than that. It's like to, to be successful and to be happy and to improve as a person, to develop, to become you know, we're, we're supposed to be talking a little bit today about becoming the best version that you want to be, right? And, and you know, in my mind, there's, there can be nothing more awesome and nothing more motivating than gracing the planet with the best version of you, right? And a big part of my motivating factor, and that's not a, that's not a selfish thing. It's not about, you know, I just want to be the best guy. It's about 
be the best version of you so that you can give, right? So be the best version of you so that you can be an awesome mate, so you can be an awesome brother, so you can be an awesome teammate, so you can be an awesome boss, so you can be an awesome everything and give back. Um, and there can be nothing better than that. And, and it's really the people that are around you are so important to that. And from a professional point of view, uh, you know, my story is about being in the right place at the right time with the right people. Uh, and I've always chosen people over like a cold metric opportunity thing. You know, I've always been like, follow that guy because he's awesome and he's smart and he wants the best for you and you can learn from him. So go with that. And, you know, there's been so many times in, in my own career, particularly when I was inside Comley, which is not a super high profile company, but we were doing amazing things when, you know, people are, you know, why don't you go to Facebook? Why don't you go to Google? Why don't you start your own company? But I was working with amazing people, you know, and that was my inspiration. Uh, and it was having those people around you that you're learning from and want the best for you and you want the best for them. And so, you know, a big part of having a successful life and having a successful career is surrounding yourself with amazing people that want the best for you. And then you can give your best to them as well. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, and we don't want it to get too philosophical, but uh, you know, ultimately uh, the people in your life and the places that you go and the experiences that you have are all there really is like everything else. is yeah. just a conduit to having like having an amazing time with people that you love having an amazing experience with people that you love and going to amazing places with people that you love. That's it. Like everything else that you do, no one wants to build a company on their own and then sit on their own. Nobody wants to go somewhere on their own and sit there on their own. You wants to have a million dollars and spend it on your own. It's all, they're all just chips. They're all just opportunities to build businesses with other people, get money to do great things with other people. Um, and my own personal journey, you know, and whatever success I've had, as, as the older I've got, the more I've realized it was all about having these people around me that, you know, and I did it instinctively at first. I just kind of gravitated towards them and was like, I love this guy. He's great. And he's really passionate and he really wants me to do well. And I always just went with that. And then as I got a little bit older, by older, I mean like thirties, you know, turned 30 and I started to realize this is actually like a code that I should follow, you know, like just surround yourself with great people and, um, and try to edit out people that are, you know, anyone that you think is not really batting for you don't spend so much time with those people yeah it's, it, it's a really good reflection on success and uh, but I, I mean i think when i look back at my own time and i took a year out similar to you and we'll get on to that in a second in uh 2016 it was and it was probably the most important year i've ever had just in terms of trying to figure out what success means because for 14 years up to that point, you're just chasing this ambition, it's chase, it's chase and chase. And you took a year out in 2018. So how much of your philosophical view on success is down to having that time to actually reflect and look back and, and I guess get your feet on the ground a little bit? Yeah, that's a great question. Now we talked about this a little bit at the weekend, right? Um, and so I think I'm better at communicating it for having had that year out, you know? Yeah. So like I, I understand it better i can articulate it better uh i knew but but i was doing it anyway you know in my 20s uh, and i'm 40 now by the way which as you can tell i even struggle to say that uh but uh, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, uh you know in my 20s i was doing it instinctively in my 30s i started like doing that as a you know as, as a code um but taking a year around 2018 was was an awesome thing for me and uh I'm a planner anyway, you know, and so, I, you know, I think we're going to talk a little bit later, more practical stuff, uh, but I'm a planner anyway. 2018 was a good time for me because I just, I spent a lot of time just thinking about what have I done? Where have I been? Why? Like, why did that happen to me? And which bits did I like? What have I achieved? Uh, and then going forward, you know, what do I want to do next? And what's my motivation? And, and what do I want the next 10 years to look like? And why? Like, what am I actually driving towards? Um, and what I, re what I realized was, and uh, if this is useful for anyone, then, you know, take it. But uh, you can call it a midlife crisis if you like, because it probably was. Uh, but what I realized was... I got, I got Julie messaging saying, don't not be 40, I'm in my late 50s. I can see that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're right. This is a, this is a personal issue. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but what I realized was that I'd, I'd been running so hard at, at just trying to get to this place, you know, like trying to 
so and I hadn't really articulated it. It was like I want to be successful, right? And like somewhere, and I know I was talking to you about this at the weekend, but somewhere in the back of my mind, but I hadn't really thought about it. I imagined that 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 it was a linear thing, and that I was going to get to this point and be sat in this room with some people, and then just go, "I've made it." You know, like there was going to be this moment, and it was like, "I'm I'm I'm done." Like I've made it, right? Is it maybe it was a number? Maybe it was a pe- a person. I hadn't really thought about it that much, but during my, during my year out, I started to realize it doesn't exist. You know, like I've been in those places, I've been in those rooms, I've done those things, and it's not, that's not the right motivating factor. Um, and I already was kind of planning things out in terms of, you know, things that, who am I and what do I want to do? I think we're going to talk about truth, you know, planning in a minute your life, which I think is important. And I was already good at that. But the big thing in my year out was that I sort of realized that, you know, it's not a linear journey and there is no such thing as like success, you know, and it's much more multi-layered than that. And some of these things are probably obvious, uh, mm. but, it was a really, but it was a really good time for me. Um, and, and I think it made me a better person. Yeah, I felt that as well. I mean, look, not, let's be honest, not everybody has the opportunity, uh, whether it be time, resources, situation, whatever you is you want to call it, to just take a year out and, and have that time to, to reflect. So I want to try and get onto some sort of practical uh, sort of maybe tips or advice that you can give people because I think for a lot of, whether it be sales per people, consultants, it's people in general, I guess, trying to understand what they want out of life is probably one of the biggest questions, right? Yeah. Um, how, how they actually figure out what they want and then plan to execute that to get where they want to be. So for somebody that can't necessarily take a year out, I think self-reflection is obviously massively important. It's something that, you know, I do every single day, something that people should do every day, but to try and maybe give some people a bit more practical um, advice around it, what would you be um, telling people? Yeah. And so we were talking about that year out just because it's fun because we both did it. Right. Uh, uh, But but, I mean, a lot of the things that, that, that I thought about in that year out, I was already thinking about, to your point, it was a it was a it was a bit of a luxury because I had more time than I had before uh, to kind of self reflect on what goals am I setting for myself and why, who do I want to be, uh, and then you know to come back to that point before you know being the best version of yourself. You know, it's kind of you're only here for you've only got this one opportunity to be here, and so you might as well be, and and, and you're you, and that's all you've got really. You know, like you and the people around the experiences you have. So being the best version of yourself that you can be uh, is a beautiful thing and it will allow you to contribute to everybody else around you uh, to the maximum level. And I have always had that attitude. I just had a bit more time to reflect on it in 2018. So one of the things that that is a big thing of mine, and I feel that people don't do that much, uh, is treat yourself as a business. You know, like we go to work every day, most people, uh, and we get paid a certain amount of money uh, to perform a certain amount of tasks. Uh, and because we're getting paid money to do them, uh, we're quite you know, diligent and rigorous, most of us, about getting that shit done because you know, we want to make that value exchange fair. But we don't put that much planning into ourselves and, and who we are and what we want to be. So one of the big things that I always, I've always said uh, is you know, treat yourself as a business. Treat yourself like you treat tasks at work and, a, and as a business. Um, and I think that's really important as an ethos. Um, and then from a practical point of view, um, and I think we've got a few people on the call, on the call that I've bored about this so much, uh, but I'm a big believer in macro to micro planning. And so uh, the way that I do it, and disclaimer, you know, I think everybody should find their own way to do stuff. And yeah. it's whatever operating system works for you. So you take that view of treat yourself as a business and then build your own operating system that treats yourself as a business. What works really well for me is I divide my life into home and work because that's, you know, the two most important things, getting shit done at work and then, you know, being great there, but also your own personal life. Um, I then set myself annual goals across that. And so the good thing that happened in 2018 was it allowed me to think a lot about who do I want to be and what things do I want to be. For example, you know, I think about myself as being creative but what am I actually doing creatively? Like not that much, right? And I think about myself as being a giver and being kind, but what am I doing? Not that much. Like I'm kind to the people around me, but you know, when I go to work, I process the shit out of stuff. 
why am I not processing the shit out of being kind? You know, like I should build that, right? And so home and work, and then everything that you want to be, a philanthropist. So, you know, things that I came up with was a, ph a philanthropist, creative, uh, interested in science and innovation, family, uh, healthy, fit, all of those things that you want to be, set those as macro goals at home. And then what do you want to be at work? You know, so for me, it was, I want to be a business leader. I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to be an advisor. I want to be an investor. And then what does that look like? So build those annual goals, home and work. Um, and then I said I was a planner. I also then build quarterly targets against that. And so this, this is all in a hierarchy on my Evernote. There's the annual plan and then there's a quarterly plan. So, okay, which in the next three months, what am I going to do to achieve that thing? You know, so if it's like being creative, uh, guitar lessons, uh, writing poetry, you know, how much am I going to do of that? Uh, if I, if I'm giving, well then what does that look like? You know, how many times am I going to go and do charity things? Put that in your quarterly plan. And then there's the daily to-do list. So it's annual, quarterly, daily, home, and work. And I've been running that system for about 10 years. Uh, in 2018, it went into overdrive because I kind of, what started off as writing a CV turned into, which I started writing a CV and it took me three months. So I started writing a CV and I started writing things that were the best version of me but I hadn't done it, right? So I was like, so I was like writing, I'm this. And I was like, no, you're not. Like you think you are, but you're not, right? You can say that you are, you can talk about those things, but you're not actually doing it. So all that really happened in 2018 was that I took this operating system and it went into overdrive. And so, and that was a really good thing for me. But anybody can, you know, you should pick your own operating system, but anybody can treat themselves like a business. Anybody can set themselves annual plans. And I've been doing it for 10 years. I go home to Lancashire and every year I sit in a pub, pint of Guinness, and I write my annual personal plan and my annual uh, career plan. And then I set the Q1 target and then it's just like bang, bang, bang. And then every quarter it pops up in my calendar and I write the next quarterly target. And of course I don't do everything that I'm going to do, but it means that I'm getting closer to being the best version of me always at home and at work. Yeah, do you, do you beat yourself up? pretty badly if you don't achieve those things or do you just take it on the chin that you can't do everything that you've set like where, where's where's the, the line between this is what I need to I'm going to do versus okay I didn't get around to that this time but I achieved 80% of the shit that I set out to do yeah yeah I mean it's, it's a great question I mean I think anyone who's you know competitive and you know wants to progress as a person and progress at work and uh and just be great right like which most people do you always beat yourself up. And I actually believe that everybody beats themselves up way too much. And that the, the standards that you hold yourself to are way higher generally than the standards that you hold other people to. Uh, so, I mean, I guess the short answer is, yeah, I do. Uh, and, you know, it's important to, you know, manage that, you know, make sure you're not setting annual targets, which are crazy. Uh, make sure, you know, that's what I like about quarterly targets because otherwise you're kind of doing stuff but a year is a long time and then what do you set and you forget and where are you up to? And so, and the good thing about quarterly, you know, sprints, right? You know, it's what's great about engineers and developers. One thing I learned from engineers and developers, great at sprints. Sprints are such an amazing thing, you know, and it was only when I started you know, working with engineering teams and developing teams and running uh, engineering teams, I, I learned the whole concept of sprints. Super cool. So like set an annual target and then a sprint. And mm -hmm. then, if you, you know, if the sprint's 100 meters and you only did 10 meters, that's okay because you're going to build another sprint. Go back and revise the annual plan, build your next sprint. And yeah. so, you know, bite-sized chunks helps with that. Everybody does it. Uh, but, but it's amazing also at the same time how many people and, you know, friends who are on this call and friends that I know, like, you know, I'm always, I'm really boring about this stuff. Like, I'm, I'm always like, have you written your New Year's resolution? Send me your New Year's resolutions. And people don't even write a New Year's resolution. And I'm writing a goddamn business plan for myself. You know, and so I think, you know, if you want to if you, if you improve as a person uh, and be the best version of you that you can be, which I think is a great goal to have, treat yourself as a business and, and, and plan it out. Yeah, so what I, what I take from that is almost step one is just almost clearing your desk and, and just writing down who you want to be as a person, right? Who you want to be perceived as, what you want to go out to the world and do. And that's your starting point to then building everything else off the back of, right? Exactly. So I was doing this anyway. The, 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 good, the, the thing that 2018 gave me was really the chance to flesh it out more. 
you know, because I, like I said, what started off was me writing a bio. And I think it's really interesting that I started writing this supercharged version of me because it's a sales document. And yeah. then I, then I started getting annoyed, like, well, you are creative, but you haven't really done that much in five years. Yeah. You could put that, but why don't we actually start doing this stuff? So yeah, you know, write, decide who you are, split it into home and work, write those things out and then they become buckets. And then against that, you write your annual plan and then your quarterly sprint and then your daily to-do list. And it just, the great thing about, some, sometimes people think that planning is uh, inhibiting uh, and, it, and it, you know, it's, I don't want to spend time on that. I just want to be doing stuff. But the great thing about planning is that it actually frees you up because you no longer have to think about, well, what am I supposed to be doing and what is my North Star and what am I trying to get done? You can just be your authentic, creative, awesome self and you've got the, the, the checkpoints to go and check back against it. And if you don't do it that year, you can go again next year. You know, you don't have to knock everything out of the park, but, you know, I, I guarantee that if you treat yourself as a business, if you plan out your personal work life, if you work in sprints, you'll do 10 to 15% more in a year and you'll feel good about it. And, you know, that's a great thing, right? Yeah, it's an awesome thing, mate. I mean, look, I've known you now for, what, six, 16 years, I think. Yeah, crazy. Pretty scary. Um, and in 16 years, I don't think I've ever heard you moan about anything, pretty much. So <laughs> you're either the most luckiest person in the world and you've never got any shit going on, or you're just really good at, like, decompartmentalizing it. Because... Naturally, you can write these plans. You can have the goals and the targets and the daily plans and the weekly plans, but sometimes shit does just get in the way. Personal life gets in the way. How do, how do you deal with, I, I call them negative interruptions. Like how, how do you deal with negative interruptions? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a great question. Uh, and, you know, there's no right or wrong answer to this. And obviously nobody is ever going to give you the answer to this because it's impossible, right? I mean, life is challenging. Uh, you are going to have good times and bad fat times. Things are going to go wrong. So you know, if anybody, no one's going to say, this is how you do it. You know, and I certainly can't do that either. Uh, but some things that work for me. Um, and so the first thing is, I hate moaning. You know, just like negativity, I cannot deal with it. So, and, you know, I think that anyone that thinks that just moaning about stuff and just spousing negativity is useful to them or anyone else, it's, it's just got it wrong. Like, it's not that useful. Um, yeah. I think what is useful is letting things out, you know, like yeah. talking things through, uh, letting out that energy, get it all out on the table, uh, but then immediately getting into problem solving mode, you know, so, um, and so I'm okay with somebody coming up to me and going like breaking down and whatever it looks like and just going like emotional breakdown, burst into tears or just massive rant, massive anger, you know, WTF totally fine like i am totally okay with that uh as long as once you've got that out it's like okay so what do we want to do like how can we make this better you know and so that's always been my attitude so i just can't like i, I like negativity and moaning really is my kryptonite and anyone that knows me well knows that uh like it just does it, it's not a good idea to moan around me because i just totally switch off uh in fact i get really angry uh, uh so i just don't think moaning is useful uh but but the way i deal with it is you know like uh, I am not perfect at all. Uh, but, you know, I'll just have a, a vent. People that know me will know. You know, I've definitely got a bit of a temper. You know, I'm half Irish, ginger head dude. You know, I'll get angry. But then as soon as it's out, I'm like, okay, what should we do? You know, like, so having a problem-solving attitude in general in life is very, very important. Um, yeah. And I, I've always, you know, just having that approach and just decide to have that approach. And I think you can just decide to have that approach. Moaning and negativity is completely useless. Uh, another thing is compartmentalization. You touched on that. You know that it's one of my big things that you know I always go on about. But it's it's a difficult skill, and I'm definitely not perfect at this. But in the modern life, you are dealing with lots and lots of different components of your life and different people, and it's very important to compartmentalize. Like just because one thing in one part of your life at that particular time on that day has not gone well, does not mean that overall your life is not going well. And it yeah. also definitely doesn't mean that all the other people deserve to have a shit day because you had that one bit. And so it's quite common for me actually, 
which I don't know if it's a good or a bad thing, but, you know, if I do end up being negative about something, I always end up saying sorry, you know, I'm like, I'm sorry about that, you know, because it's like, it ain't your fault. This is this one thing in my one life. And so I actually feel bad about it. But compartmentalization is hard. But with all of these things, they're not easy. And I'm certainly not sitting here saying I am absolutely perfect at these things. But the things which I think are important that I try to implement, and compartmentalization is a really useful thing to keep in mind as a framework, you know, and realize that thing at that time in my life on that day did not go well, but all these other things are actually going quite well. So compartmentalization is important. Um, another thing that I find really uh, useful is big picture, little picture. Um, so I've got loads of these. So these are just little rules that I live by. So big picture, little picture is super important. So whenever something's going bad at that time, it can always feel like it's a disaster, right? Oh, you didn't get that deal or, you know, that person said something terrible to you or whatever it is that you wanted at that time didn't go well, right? Taxi drivers, as you know, really wind me up. So you have a bad taxi journey, right? But you have to go big picture, little picture. Like big picture is everything's great. You know, most of the time things are good. Most of the time life is good. Most of the time, if you're, and another part of this is, uh, if you are doing the things that we've spoke about, which is trying to be the best version of yourself, you'll actually find then that good things come back. You know, what you put out in the world comes back to you. So when you have that lens and you treat yourself as a business and you're trying to do good, you're going to have so many good things happening to you anyway, because that's just what happens. And so then big picture, little picture and compartmentalization becomes easier because you're kind of like, well, oh, big picture, hey, it's got loads of this good stuff going on. And compartmentalization, it's only this one thing because I got my plan and I'm hitting my plan. And, and so, you know, these are all useful. It doesn't mean that they're perfect, but hopefully they're useful lenses and frameworks uh, for people to take away and use. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, brilliant, mate. Look, I'm going to go to a couple of questions right now and then we'll probably wrap up with just you giving it, I guess, can I call them life lessons that you want to pass on? Um, but let me just go to a couple of questions. Um, who inspires you or who's inspired you? And I guess probably that's going to be different regarding like, different stages of your life, right? Is this where I'm supposed to say you? <laughs> you can if you want. <laughs> you can if you want. Uh, so uh, big picture, little picture. So big picture, the, 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 the things, the people that have always inspired me are the people that are around me in my life, you know? And so um, it's the, originally when I, was, when I was a bit younger, it was people that were investing in me, right? And it still is now, but also when you're younger, especially, it's people that gave me a chance, right? And people that obviously were a batting for you and gave you an opportunity and gave you that chance. Uh, and then as you get a bit older, uh, it becomes the people around you that, that hopefully you get to give a chance to, you know? And so in the last five to, I would say the last five to 10 years, and increasingly what's really inspired me is being part of a team and part of a company and provide and, and building an opportunity for everybody to grow and do better. So it's been, you know, the people and teams around me, it's been the businesses that we've built, it's been the friendships that I've got. Uh, and it's that ecosystem of people, and, and then at work and at business and all of that together. And so it's not, it's definitely not, I, I can't, I mean, there's lots of people that I admire who are famous and of course there are, but the, the big inspirations in my life and the older I've got, the more I realize how fortunate I've been. I'm massively fortunate at the right place and the right time with the right people have been the people in my immediate life. The people that gave me the opportunity at Sign Media, Nick Rose, who's uh, on this call, uh, the person that gave me the opportunity at CBS, Nick Forbert, yourself and we became friends in Shanghai and, and sort of started dreaming about, you know, we're going to go places and we're going to travel the world. Uh, you know, and then uh, Amar Goel at Comley and uh, there's too many to mention, Ben Leg at Abhala um, and, and, and it's just all these people that you invest time in, you surround yourself with good people and the more you do that and the more you invest in them without expecting it back you just invest in them because you like them and then they start investing in you uh, and it's a beautiful thing so i would say that uh yeah it's, it's it's the people around me that have inspired me the most okay cool i'm going to invite uh bryn mullen i think bryn at the moment is in zimbabwe um i'm gonna unmute him and then i'm gonna ask him to share a bit share himself and come onto the screen and, and ask you a question bryn 
Hi there, Greg. Thanks very much. And hi, Matt. Thank you very much for, for your talk. No worries. Hey, Brian. How are you doing? Yeah, very, very well. Thank you. Um, I guess my question is, is you know, what's, what's been... I know we've, you've spoken a, a lot about, uh, you know, different stages of your life and different things that have contributed to certain things. But if you had to choose, it's probably... A, an impossible question to answer, but um, what's been the biggest factor that's contributed to your success, do you feel? Uh, yeah, it's a really good question. Um, and so I think the first thing I would say is a follow on from what I was just talking about before, which is just being in the right place at the right time uh, with the right people. Um, and then kind of link to that, but a little bit separate, just putting yourself out there. Right. So if you if you put yourself out there and you back yourself and you invest in what's happening around you and you surround yourself with the right people uh, and you do that enough, you will end up in these environments where good shit happens. You know, it's like if you're investing in other people and, and, and the right people uh, and you come at it with the right attitude and you put yourself out there. And um, one of the things we've not spoke about is just like, how can I add value? You know, a lot of people kind of not a lot of people, some people uh, turn up uh, to life or to things and expect things to happen to them and feel like they deserve, like you start off as like, I deserve this or this should come to me. Um, and I think also the older you get, the more that you realize, number one, life is not fair, you know, like it just isn't. Uh, and, but if you surround yourself with the right people and you're constantly thinking, so you've got great people around you, and then you're coming at it with, how can I add value? You know, I put myself out there, I'll back myself, and I just want to be adding value. Then those things start to pile up and add up, you know? And certainly, you know, particularly myself, like the older I've got, and I look back in the last 10 years, I realized some of the things, you know, some of the things that we ended up doing, like buying active digital, you know, when I look back on that now, I was 29 years old, and I had no freaking idea what I was doing. I mean, I really didn't. But I was, you know, my, I was surrounded by people that, that wanted me to win, you know, and were backing me and helping me out with stuff and pushing me to do it. And if they hadn't have done it, I wouldn't have done that. So really, it was about the right place at the right time. And, and, and hopefully I'd added enough value that they wanted me to win as well. And, and it became this beautiful reciprocal thing. So, um, you know, in short, I would say surround yourself with the right people uh, and invest in those people and, and, and be asking yourself all the time, how am I adding value? And if you do that enough and you keep putting yourself out there and you work hard, uh, then good things happen. Perfect. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Nice. You've got my brother on now, mate. Ben wants no to jump and ask a question. So, Ben, if you want to uh, unmute yourself or drop your video on. Hey, Matt, how are you doing? Hello, Ben. How are you, mate? I'm not going to put my video on because, uh, yeah, I've had a few drinks, but uh, I thought I'd just ask a quick question on what would be your definition of success? I think, obviously, a lot of people determine success by different factors, whether it's starting a family, earning lots of money, or just being a great person in general. Uh, so I just want to ask what your definition would be of being successful. I think it's an absolutely brilliant question, mate. Um, and uh, you know, myself and Greg, we had a quick, quick call last weekend as we, as we were prepping for this, or just basically catching up and making sure the Zoom works. Uh, we ended up <laughs> we ended up we ended up talking about this, uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna answer that partly with my own unique ex like from a personal point of view, uh, and then hopefully that will parlay a little bit into a, a broader answer, but. Um, as I do the other way around, the broader answer. So the broader answer is, I think it's really important to have a postcard in your head. Um, and this is something that I talk to people a lot about, which is just ask someone, well, what's your postcard? And that's why I like the annual planning thing and treating yourself as a business. Because treating yourself as a business doesn't mean I want to be a CEO, I want to make a million dollars or whatever that looks like. Treat yourself as a business means achieve the things for me and what success looks like for me. And what success looks like for me is your postcard, right? And that postcard is really unique. Like when you're a kid and you went on a holiday, uh, like if you're 40, if you're a bit younger, maybe not, but you went on a holiday and then you buy a postcard, right? And you send it back. And the whole point of the postcard was to say, this is, 
this is what beautiful looks like. I've just had a beautiful experience. Wish you were here, right? Like this is it. And so the postcard is a really good tool against framework and lens. Like what is your postcard? And to your point, your postcard, everybody's postcard is different, right? And everybody, you treat yourself as a business means move to your postcard. So just write those things out. Like if your goal is to, you know, have a hundred days off in a year to go and travel the world, right? Or your goal is to have a hundred days free to write a hundred books, right? Or your goal is to, you know, I want to be a writer. So I want to have a hundred days free to write this. None of these things are about being successful in the capitalist sense of the world, of the word. They're about being successful against your postcard. So the big picture answer to it is know your postcard. And I think you can divide it into home and work. You know, it's like, what does it look like? Well, it means, you know, I just want to, I just want to be comfortable at work. I just want to be steady and stable and I need to make enough money to do this. And this looks like this, that might be your postcard and that's totally fine. But a lot of people are running around. I always say that some people are running around and they've got no idea what the postcard is. Uh, and so the big picture answer is know your postcard, treat yourself as a business to be at your postcard and that postcard can and will change. You know, it's like in your early twenties and Ben, we spent a lot of time together in your early twenties, uh, in my mid to late twenties, you know, your postcard is nothing like what it looks like now, right? With, you know, with your uh, beautiful wife, um, and the family that you're, uh, the family situation that you're looking to build is totally different and that's totally fine. So I think know your postcard and then build against that. Um, and then for me personally, that was, that's why the 2018 conversation popped up because for, for me personally, like I, I was so driven to become something, but I didn't really know what it was. And the good thing about 2018 for me was that I spent a bit of time thinking about my postcard. Uh, and there was a whole load of things that when I started writing about myself, like I realized the best version of Matt is not working, you know, 10 hours a day to, to be a CEO and do all this. Like that's part of it. And that's part of my postcard. But there's, there's these other things that I'm not doing at all that I really need to put into my postcard. And so, you know, that, I, I think that that's right. Uh, and then the final thing I would say on this, that, you know, a lot of people talk about uh, being motivated by fear and greed, right? And I think the capitalist economy uh, makes us gravitate towards those things. Like the capitalist economy makes the two strongest motivators being fear of like not having enough money, not being successful in a capitalist way, or greed must have more money, right? And I think a much better motivator than that uh, is be the best version of you, right? And so the middle way. And the middle way, the best version of you is your postcard. So the middle way, the best version of you, build your postcard, treat yourself as a business, plan it every year, and then allow yourself to change, you know, because you will change over time and that's fine. Cheers, mate. Thanks, Bob. No worries. Ben, I want to see your postcard on Sunday. Yeah, can you draw it and send it? <laughs> um, we're running over, but I'm going to keep going anyway because it's really interesting stuff. I don't think we're probably going to get through everything we spoke about, Matt, but maybe we'll have you on again and we'll run through uh, uh, more in a, in, a, in a part two. But there's, right. there's two questions that have come through that I actually really want the answers to as well, so I'm going to ask them. Okay. Uh, one's from uh, Todd Brizendine, and I'm not sure, sure if he's a buddy of yours or not. Um, yeah. outside, of, outside of business and sales, um, what's your life postcard? What's my what, sorry? Your life postcard. I, you know, family, I, yeah. yeah. Yeah, great question. Outside, um, the outside of business. The, t t typical of Todd, hit me with the personal questions. Yeah, and so I think that like pre-2018, I hadn't spent enough time on this. Um, but if I had spent time on it, my postcard would have been very much, and I think that's why Todd is asking, I was so driven to be this thing, which I, you know, I'm sharing a lot today. Hopefully that's you know, useful. Uh, but, you know, like I, I spent 15 years trying to become this thing that I hadn't really decided what that is yet. I just knew that I wanted to be, you know, be, be successful. Uh, and 2018 uh, allowed me to think a lot more about other things that I want to do as well. Not that I wasn't doing loads of stuff, don't get me wrong. Uh, but, you know, just other things that if I just kept being so driven all the time, 
that I might not get as much time to do. And so it allowed me to think a bit more about my postcard. Uh, and so, you know, also as I get older, uh, you know, of course I want to have a family, right? And so, you know, I need to start. Your, your, um, your missus is on this call, isn't she? She should be. Is that, is that going to be news to her or is... Uh... <laughs> We've talked about this postcard. Uh, um, so we have talked about this postcard, yeah. And, I, and, and you know, I think probably because Todd knows me, he knows that I, wasn't, I didn't spend a lot of time thinking about that. And I hadn't really, you know, I was so, you know, again, this is a personal thing, but, you know, I was like so driven to, to, to win in the, in, in the business setting that I hadn't really thought about everything that I want in my life. Uh, and so, yeah, now I think a postcard involves, you know, I want to have a family. Um, I want to have roots uh, in Lancashire. That's really important to me. And so, you know, my mum and dad every year, obviously when I go home every year, it's like, when are you coming home? Uh, and I've always just like shrugged the shoulders, you know, but as I've got older, that's become a thing, you know, so in my, I like to have a family. I want to have roots in Lancashire. Um, I'd like to have a global lifestyle. So, you know, have still travel, but have roots at home and maybe live in two or three different places. Um, I really want to have a dog. Uh, and so the, these are things that really I thought about a lot in 2018. Uh, and so my postcard has changed. Um, and so I think the main takeaway is it's important to know it, right? And so many people, and I didn't, did, I was doing the annual planning thing. I was treating myself as a business. So I was getting a lot done, both at work and, and at play. And so that's, that's good. But I didn't know what I was going towards as much, like the macro macro. Uh, and so I think, you know, the full, the full set there, if you will, the full stack uh, is to really know your postcard build yourself an annual plan every year and allow yourself to think about how that postcard has changed and then quarterly plans and then, you know, getting shit done daily against it. Nice, mate. Okay. Now I said I was going to ask one more question and then give you one more kind of topic to talk about, but actually it's going to cover the same thing because the question is something that I was going to ask anyway, which is, um, what is one of the favorite quotes that you live by? Did somebody really ask that? Yep. Wow. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> one of my favorite quotes, so my favorite author, uh, and by the way, this is, this is not a very practical quote to be honest, but, uh, but it, but it's beautiful language. So my, my favorite book of all time is, uh, on the road, uh, by Jack Kerouac. Uh, I just, it's what kind of, I read it as a teenager. It's one of the things that motivated me to travel alongside me. Sorry. On the road. On the road? Yep. Yeah, by Jack Kerouac. Uh, it's one of the things that really mo motivated me to travel uh, originally alongside meeting uh, quite a lot of Asian people um, at university and thinking about going to Asia. Um, and so that's my favorite book. Jack Kerouac's my favorite author. Um, and then the line out of that book uh, is, the only people for me are the mad ones, the ones who are mad to live, mad to talk, mad to be saved, desirous of everything at the same time. The only people for me are the mad ones, the ones who are mad to live, mad to talk, mad to be saved, desirous of everything at the same time. And what I, obviously, it's beautiful. Uh, and I find it very, it's, it's poetically motivating. Uh, and it makes me want to be someone like that. Uh, and it kind of plays into my creative artistic side of me and wanting to travel and have experiences and life is really all about people and experiences and they're the most important things. So it hits all those notes. Uh, but the other thing I really like about it is that I think that everybody is that person, Like everybody wants to be that shining light in the room. You know, everybody wants to be that person that people love to be around and are doing great stuff. And we all want to feel uh, validated by other people. Life is just about people and experiences. So I think everybody wants to be the mad one who's desirous of everything and traveling. But I think that sometimes people don't have the right set of opportunities or they don't have the right people around them or they don't have the right toolkit to go and be that person. Because to be that person, you need to be the best version of yourself. Uh, so, you know, personally what really motivates me as I get a little bit older is, you know, where I can you know, how can I help people along that journey? You know, because I got quite fortunate. I got very fortunate to move to Asia at, at, at the right time and, and meet some amazing people uh, and go on this amazing journey. Most of it was about right place, right time, right people. So, you know, as, as, as the older I get, 
what I love to do where I can is to help other people to you know be that person and, and go on that journey um, and so that's my favorite quote okay that's amazing Matt we're going to wrap it up there uh, for this evening but um, we're definitely going to get you back on uh, to talk about more tips tricks and just life in general uh, it's been an absolute pleasure right. uh, having you can't believe it's taken us 16 years to do this but hey we get there anyway um, right. for everybody that's obviously been on, on on the zoom hangout this evening thanks ever so much for taking some time out of your uh, out of your friday uh, we'll continue to do this show obviously your support matters so if you can go to the global network live instagram give us a bit of a like go to the youtube channel this uh will be available on replay tomorrow and on all podcasts uh, by uh, Monday. So for myself, Greg Stockton, and Matt, thank you ever so much for joining us. Matt, thanks for logging in from Singapore. Again, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks, guys. Cheers, thank guys. You. Have a great weekend. Stay safe, and uh, we'll catch you on the next one. Cheers. Cheers.